Let's work some problems here to review for test four. This is applications of the derivative. So first we have a function f of x equals x squared minus 3x to the two-thirds. And can we first find where intervals, the intervals where f is increasing and decreasing? Where is f concave up and concave down? Can we find any relative extrema? Can we find any points of intersection? I'm sorry, not points of intersection, points of inflection. And then can we sketch the graph? So first, let's get the information we can from the derivative. So we're going to find f prime of x. That's going to be 2x minus, and then 2 thirds times 3 is going to be 2x to the negative 1 third power. We want to set that equal to 0 and solve. We want any points that will make it equal to 0 or undefined. So let's maybe write that as 2x equals... And then we can write that, if I add that 2x to the negative one-third to the other side, and I'm going to write it for a moment as 2 over the cube root of x, we can see that we have that uh, there's going to be a critical point at x equals 0. So because that would make the denominator 0 in 2 over the cube root of x. So then I'm going to multiply the cube root of x times 2x. So that's going to be 2x to the, let's see, 3 thirds plus 1 third will be 4 thirds. Power equals 2. If we divide by 2, we'll get 1. We can raise both sides to the 3 fourths power. Now, 1 to any power is 1, but when you have that fourth root and we're solving an equation, that means we're going to get a positive or a negative. So we're going to get positive and negative 1 as critical points. So we're actually getting three critical points, 0, 1, and negative 1. Let's look at our number line. So this is going to be f prime. We're going to put 0 in the middle. There's 1, and there's negative 1. So if we plug in, say, a negative 2, then we can see that... Let's see, the, mm, where's a nice place to look at this? How about we plug in negative 8? That might be a little easier because we can do the cube root. So we're thinking of this as 2x minus 2 over the cube root of x. So plugging in negative 8, we'd get negative 16. And then the cube root of negative 8 is a negative 2. 2 over negative 2 is 1, is negative 1 rather. Minus a negative 1 is a plus 1 but that's still going to be negative over here. If we plug in something between 0 and negative 1, maybe we can think of something like negative 1 eighth. Then 2 times a negative 1 eighth is going to be a negative 1 fourth. So that's a negative 1 fourth. And in the cube root, the cube root of negative 1 eighth is negative 1 half. That's going to be multiplying that negative 2, make it a positive 4. So I think we're going to switch to positive in there. If we try the positive 1 8th, then we're going to get a minus 4 here. And that's going to be a positive 1 half there. So it's going to switch to negative again. Is that right? Yep, and then if we plug in, say, a positive 8, then we're going to get 16 from the 2x and then we'll get a minus 4 from the 2 over cube root of x, so that's going to be positive again. So to answer our question for part A, I think I'm going to make this a different color. So for part A, we're going to have f is increasing on that interval from negative 1 to 0, and also on the interval from 1 to infinity. And f is going to be decreasing on the interval from negative infinity to negative 1, and also from 0 to 1. Okay, let's go on and find the second derivative. So we're going to work on part b now. So the second derivative is going to be 2, and then we're going to get a plus 2 thirds x to the negative four thirds and again we're going to look for where is it zero or undefined so that's going to be two plus 
2 over 3, and then that's going to be the cube root of x to the 4th. So there is our second derivative. We can see that uh, this is going to be equal to 0, so these are now pips, potential inflection points. So 0 is going to be one place where it might change concavity. And I think that's going to be about it. Let's see, if we subtract the 2 to the other side, and we've got 2 over 3 cube root of x to the 4th. If we multiply that to the other side, we've got negative 2 times the 3 makes that a negative 6. 6 cube root of x to the 4th is equal to 2. And so, yeah, I think if we do this, we divide by the negative 6. We've got the cube root of x to the 4th is equal to negative 1 -third. When we cube both sides, we're going to get x to the 4th is a negative 1 27th. But when we try to take the 4th root of a negative, that's not going to give us anything. So our only potential inflection point is going to be 0. So let's look at our number line for f double prime. And 0 is the only place where it could change. So if we plug in a negative number, then uh, no matter what we plug in to x to the fourth, it's going to be a positive. And so everything else is positive. So this is going to be positive on both sides. And so our answer to part b is that f is going to be concave up uh, everywhere except at uh, 0, where it is uh, un, yeah, the, it's not defined. So, uh, or at least not where, I think we can just say it's going to be concave up for all reals. I believe we can get away with that because the, the curve is defined at 0. Hmm. Interesting question there. Let's find any relative extrema. So we're going to get uh, relative, let's see, it goes from negative to positive at negative 1. So that's going to be a relative minimum. And if we plug in negative 1, we're going to get negative 1 squared is 1. And then minus 3 times the cube root of negative 1 is negative 1 squared is positive 1. So that's going to be a negative 2. And we're also going to get a relative min at positive 1. And that will give us the same thing. So right now we'll get 2 and then we'll get a cube root of 1 is 1 minus 2. Oh, wait, I was plugging that into the derivative. Sorry about that. Let me erase this. So we're plugging the 1 into the original, so that's going to be 1 minus, and 1 to any power is 1, so that's 1 minus 3 is also negative 2. So you have a pair of relative mins at negative 1, negative 2, and positive 1, negative 2. We're going to have a relative max at 0, and that's going to be just 0, 0. Okay, and so how about inflection points? So I'm going to come over here and look for inflection points. So it doesn't change concavity, so we don't have any inflection points at all. So we don't have any. So let's see what we can make of this graph. So we know we have a relative uh, min at... Oh, I forgot to say we have a relative max. Did I say? Oh, yeah, we did. So we got negative 1, negative 2. So negative 1, negative 2, and positive 1, negative 2, whoops, are going to be relative mins. 0, 0 is going to be our relative maximum. We know that it is going to decrease to negative 1 and be concave up. So decreasing to negative 1 and concave up will look like that. Then it's going to increase, but still stay concave up until we get to 0. Then it's going to decrease, still be concave up, till we get to uh, 
one negative two, so that doesn't look very good, but that's supposed to be a supposed to be looking like a cusp because that is gonna be a two-thirds power. So let me try to put a little more bend in there. And then it's gonna increase and be concave up the rest of the way. Well, I'm struggling to get that. It's kind of looking like a W, but with a real narrow point in the middle. So there we go. Let's go on to the next panel and see what we have in store. So let's verify the mean value theorem applies to this function on that interval and find any values of C guaranteed by the mean value theorem. So we know that our function f is uh, continuous and differentiable anywhere except at zero. Differentiable for all x not equal to zero. So the only issue we have is where it's going to be undefined. So certainly it's going to be continuous and differentiable on our interval. So now we need to know what is f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. So for us that means we want f of 8 minus f of 2 all over 8 minus 2. So let's see, f of 8 is going to be 10 minus 16 over 8 is 10 minus 2 is 8. f of 2 is 10 minus 16 over 2, which is 10 minus 8, which is 2. So we're going to get uh, f of 8 is 8 minus 2 all over 6. So that looks like 1. We need f prime of x. So we can set it equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So that's going to be, since this is a negative 16x to the negative 1, its derivative is going to be 16x to the negative 2, which we might want to think about as 16 over x squared. We're going to set that derivative equal to our f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So then multiplying that x squared to the other side and square rooting it looks like we get a positive 4 and a negative 4, but only 4 is on our interval. So 4 is our value of c guaranteed by the mean value theorem. Okay, let's look at another problem. So now we're going to try to find the point on uh, y equals square root of x plus 1 closest to 3, 0. So closest to means what we're talking about here is an optimization problem. We know that square root of x plus 1 looks like our square root function that's been translated to the left one. And we know that 3, 0 is somewhere about here. So we're trying to imagine taking some point here that's on the curve and we want to minimize that distance. So we're going to need our distance formula, which is the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. That's just Pythagorean. So for our point, the, because it's on that curve, that point is x comma square root of x plus 1. So our distance from the point on the curve to the point 3, 0 is going to be x minus 3 squared plus, and then it'll be square root of x plus 1 minus 0 squared. So that's going to be the square root of x squared minus 6x plus 9 plus x plus 1, which is the square root of x squared minus 5x plus 10. Now we can make the argument that the value of x, so the value of x that maximizes our function d also, uh, let me just say, is the same, is the same x that maximizes our function without the radical 
which I'm going to call d hat equals x squared minus 5x plus 10. Okay, so then we're going to try to maximize d hat. So d hat prime is going to be 2x minus 5. We'll set that equal to 0 to find our critical points. And so I think we're going to get uh, 5 halves. Let me try that again. Ugh, struggling here with my pen and eraser. Supposed to be equals five. Okay, so there's our five halves. Now our domain, we can see that uh, square root's not defined left of negative one, but I don't think we can disqualify anything else. So our domain, I believe, is gonna be x greater than or equal to negative one. So that's tough because it's an open-ended uh, integral, open-ended domain. So it's open to infinity on the right. So we can, do one of two things. We Because we have only one critical point, so there's our zero, there's the five halves, we could check the sign of the derivative on either side of five halves. And if we plug in something like, say, one, we can see we're going to get negative on the left. And plugging in something like, say, 10 on the right will make that positive. So we can say, uh, since d hat prime changes from negative to positive at x equals 5 halves, d hat has a relative minimum at x equals 5 halves. Because x equals 5 halves, is the only critical point on the domain d hat has an absolute max or minimum absolute min at x equals five halves okay alternatively i'm just going to throw this out there we could do kind of our modified um, candidate test, we could find d hat of 0. And d hat of 0, since where did our d hat go? It's right over here. d hat of 0 is going to equal 10. We can find d hat of 5 halves. And that's going to be, let's see, 25 fourths minus 25 halves plus 10. So that's going to be a negative 25 force plus 10, which is 40 force. So that would be a 15 force, I believe. And 15 force, 16 force would be 4, so that's 3 and 3 force. And then we could take the limit as x goes to infinity of d hat. And you can see that in d hat, as x goes to infinity, then the x squared is going to be the dominant um, factor there, and that's going to go to infinity. So we could use a modified candidate test to then claim that our maximum is going to occur at 5 halves. And we're trying to find the point, so we still got to plug that in. So our point has x coordinate 5 halves, and then we're going to go 5 halves plus 1 is 2 halves is 7 halves, so we'll get square root of 7 halves. There is our point that is closest to the point 3, 0, that point that is on that curve, y equals square root of x plus 1. All right, onward. Now, we're going to try to find the relative extrema for this function. So we have a piecewise function, so we can see that when we plug in 0, that... Uh, this top part right here is going to be equal to 0. So I'll say the that's the limit as we come in from the left. So the left-hand limit at 0 is 2. The right-hand limit 
at 0 is also 2, and that's equal to f of 2. So our function is going to be continuous there at 0. Now we can also see that the left-hand derivative is going to be 2x plus 4 evaluated at 0 is 4. So that means it's increasing to the left of uh, 0. And our right-hand derivative, now well, let's think. It might be easier just to visualize. We have the absolute value of x minus 2, which we know is going to look something like that. So it's going to look like y equals x to the right of x minus, to the right of x equals 2, and it's going to look like y equals negative x to the left of 2. So that means the derivative to the left is going to be just the derivative of negative x. So at 0, that's going to be negative 1. So we can see that it's increasing to the right and decreasing to the left. And so that means we're going to get a relative max at 0. And we said that was 2, 0, 2. So that's a, that place where they come together is going to be a corner point. And so that is a critical point because the derivative will be undefined there. Now we've got to look for other uh, critical points and other relative mins and maxes too. So for the left-hand part, the x squared um, plus 4x plus 2, we said that left-hand derivative is 2x plus 4. We can set that equal to 0 and get that x equals negative 2 is a critical point. That is in its domain, so we're left of 0. And so what we want to do is see what the sign of the derivative does on either side of negative 2. Francis or Francis Price. So we can see that if we plug in something to the left of negative 2, like say negative 3, then we're going to get a negative. And if we plug in something to the right of negative 2, like say negative 1, then we'll get a positive. So that means we're going to have a relative minimum at 0. I'm sorry, at negative 2. Let me bring my pen back up. And if we plug negative 2 into uh, our branch up here, negative 2 squared is 4. That'll be a minus 8 plus 2. So I think that'll be a negative 2 for the y-coordinate. And for the right-hand part, we know that x minus 2 has a corner point at x equals 2. So that's another critical point. And we can see that the derivative, so if we imagine our number line here, so here is our positive 2. And again, looking at what we did over here, we can see that the derivative on the left is going to be a negative. That's the slope of that line that's part of the left side of that absolute value v. And on the right side, the slope is a positive one. So since it goes from negative to positive, there's another relative minimum at 2. And when we plug that in, the absolute value of 2 minus 2 is 0. So we have two relative mins and a relative max. So there's our relative max, and these are the two relative mins. Okay, I'm going to slide this up a little bit. So uh, to find the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum for this function. So now we have a closed interval. So unlike the one we did on the optimization problem, we can actually use our candidate test, which is kind of a, a relief. We can take the derivative. We're looking for critical points. So since 1 over x is x to the negative 1, that's going to be negative x to the negative 2. And then we'll get a plus 8x. So we can think of that as negative 1 over x squared plus 8x. We can see right off the bat that x equals 0 is going to be a critical point because of the 1 over x squared. But we can also see that because our interval is from 1 to 3, that's not going to matter. So I can reject that one. If we add the 1 over x squared to the other side, 
and then multiply the x squared to the left, and then divide the 8. We're going to get x cubed is 1 8th, and so x equals 1 half is a critical point. That also is not in our interval, so it's irrelevant in our case. So all we have to do is evaluate the function at 1 and at 3, and the biggest one will be the maximum, and the smallest one will be the minimum. So plugging in 1, we're going to get 1 over 1, plus 4 times 1 squared is 5. Plugging in 3, we'll get 1 third, plus 3 squared is 9, times 4 is 36, so that's 36 and 1 third. So this is our absolute minimum, which we're going to call little m, and this is our absolute maximum, which we'll call capital M. Okay, got one more really challenging problem here. Okay, so what this, you're going to have to use your imagination here. This is supposed to be a big water trough. It's got a trapezoid, congruent trapezoids on, trapezoids on each end. They're connected to form rectangular faces that, um, between the two ends. The bases are trapezoids, so it's uh, the bases of the trapezoids are two feet by four feet. So here's the four foot part, and here's the two foot base of the trapezoid. The height of the prism is uh, this distance right here. So this is what we're calling capital H. This is the height of the trapezoid, which we're going to call little h. So it's a little confusing because. Um, our formula for the volume of a prism is the area of the base times the height of the prism. The area of the base is the area of that trapezoid, which is one-half the sum of the bases times the height of the trapezoid, and then we have another height of the prism. So it's a lot to keep straight there. First, let's find the volume of the trough, volume when the trough is full. So that's going to be, our volume is going to be that area of the base times the height, and that means we're going to take one-half times the sum of the bases, that's 2 plus 4, times the height of the trapezoid, which is another 2, times the height of the prism, which is the 5. I guess I didn't really need those brackets. So, let's see... 4 plus 2 is 6, half of that is 3, 3 times 2 is 6, 6 times 5 is 30. So that's going to be 30 cubic feet is the volume of that trapezoidal trough when it is full. Okay, now we're going to pour water in there at a rate of 4 cubic feet per minute. So that's our dvdt is this 4. And that's positive because we're filling it up. We want the rate at which the water level is rising when the water level is one foot. Now, this takes a little bit of thinking. As the water starts to fill up in here, the water level right here is what we're calling little h. So we're looking for uh, dh dt when that height of the water level is one. Notice the height of the prism, that 5, that is not changing with time. That is a constant. It's fixed. It's always 5. Okay. Well, let's see what we know. We've got a volume that is going to be 1 half times the sum of the bases. Well, that small base, that one on the bottom is the 2, that's not changing with time. But as that water level rises, this base right here is going to be changing with time. So I'm going to call that right now just that base for that base, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Now the height h of the, of the trapezoid, that little h, is that's our depth of the water there. That's changing also with time as we pour more in there. The capital H is not. That height of the trough, the height of that prism, is fixed. That's always 5. So let's look more closely at B and H there. So here is, uh, I'm going to redraw that trapezoid. Now my claim is that if we draw in a triangle here, in fact we can draw in two congruent triangles there. 
Now we know this is 2, and that's going to be 2 up there also. Now as the water level rises, so as this water level ri uh, I didn't want that to be an eraser. So as that water level rises, then we're going to get in the small triangle. We're going to have, this is our height right in here. And this is going to be, let me call that X for a moment right there. Now in the big triangle that we have up here that is fixed, since this much is 2 right here and the whole base is 4, and by the symmetry of it, this is going to be a 1. And we said this height right here is going to be 2. So we have in the big triangle, 1 is to 2 as that little x is to the height. And so that's going to tell us that 2x, let me try that again. So 2x is equal to h. So that little x is going to be 1 half h. Now that x is what we're saying is this. So I'm running out of colors here. So as we look at that water level rising, this is going to become our base that we're talking about right here of that trapezoid. That's changing with time as water pours in there. Because of the symmetry, what we have here, this x, is the same as that there. And the distance in between here is 2. So that b is going to be 2 plus two of those x's. So that means the base is two plus two of, and the x we said was one half h. So that means that that base is really two plus h. Whew. So our volume, now this is progress, is gonna be one half times two plus, that base we said is two plus h, times an h times a five. So I'm going to put the 5 together with the 1 half. That's 5 halves. And adding the 2's is going to be 4 plus h times h. So that's going to be if we distribute that 5 halves and the h, we're going to get, uh, I think, 10h plus, what's that, 5 halves h squared is going to be our volume. Oh boy, now we're making progress. So now differentiating that, we're going to get dv dt is going to be 10 times dh dt plus 5h times dh dt. We're trying to find the dh dt. We said the h was 1 over here. So, and we said that the dv dt was the 4. So we're going to get 4 is equal to 10 dh dt plus 5 times 1 is 5 dh dt. So I guess that makes 4 equal to 15 dh dt's. Or dh dt is going to be 4 fifteenths. And our units there, I think, are going to be feet per minute. Whew. That was some fun.